Two miles above the safety of the Earth, 16 women skydivers attempt what has never been done before. The goal? To maneuver their open parachutes into a connected stack that will reach 16 women high, five more than the current world record. As they begin their quest, they muster every ounce of courage to confront the life-threatening dangers that await them in the sky. really do have a sense of freedom when you're skydiving. It's very black and white. You either want to skydive or you don't. I really got involved because I saw other people doing it and it just looked like a really neat sport. important to keep your energy up and keep the adrenaline going because it's very physically and mentally straining. Canopy relative work is perhaps the most visually spectacular component of skydiving. Less than a thousand men and women worldwide participate in this very dangerous aspect of one of the world's most thrilling sports. Unlike the more traditional freefall relative work, in which skydivers form designs in the sky with their flying bodies, canopy relative work is performed after parachutes or canopies have been deployed. This highly athletic aspect of skydiving was first attempted in the mid-1970s. In the sport's infancy, many skydivers believed that to fly canopies so close together was risking death. Advances in equipment and technique reflect a sport now in its maturity, but the risks are still high. Oscillation of a canopy stack can result in collapse of the entire column, sending the skydivers plummeting towards the ground. Lines can become entangled causing the canopies to spin wildly out of control. Courage, strength, and a commitment to team effort are vital for participants in canopy relative work. It's different from most skydiving, which is before you open your parachute. It's a lot more demanding physically, and you're working with people. When you normally jump out of an airplane and, and link up holding hands, you can't hear anyone, you can't talk to anyone. You can't be relative work, there's a lot of communication and trust and you really have to work with the people you're jumping with. Skydivers come from all walks of life, but of the 23,000 members of the United States Parachute Association, only 3,000, less than 15%, are women. Of these women, no more than 100 nationwide are experts at canopy relative work. One of these exceptional women is Harvard Law School graduate, Josie Kerlinski. When I'm not skydiving, I, uh, I work a lot. I'm a lawyer and uh, I do aviation law, or I try to specialize in aviation law, which is Actually, not a coincidence. I started skydiving, and then I started flying airplanes, and then I decided that I ought to, I ought to direct my career in the same path and took up aviation law. Definitely, skydiving uh, helps get rid of stress. When you have a hard day of work, you go out and make a skydive. It's also good because it builds confidence, and it... And it uh, teaches you certain traits, working with other people, being aggressive, um, having control over what you do, um, maybe taking things to the edge, pushing yourself a little bit, and all of that leads off into at least my career. Josie, who has her private pilot's license, 
find similarities between flying airplanes and flying canopies. The nylon canopies fly with precision if wind conditions are favorable. Beginning at the canopy's front edge, or nose, wind inflates the cells, giving the canopy lift to soar through the air like an airplane wing. By pulling on the toggles, or brakes, the skydiver can turn, stall, and spin. In canopy relative work, or CRW, the skydivers deploy parachutes immediately upon exit from the plane. They direct their flight towards the other jumpers, hooking up in each other's lines to form triangles, diamonds, or tall stack formations. The best women in CRW are in excellent physical condition. Skydivers Lee and Rod Boswell keep in shape by playing squash. This intense sport develops strength and aerobic capacity, both important in physically demanding canopy relative work. Squash is a very intense sport and you, you play for about an hour and uh, it's, it's one of the racket sports that really uses up the most calories, which is one of the motivations for doing any of this stuff. But it's very anaerobic. You're always um, um, doing short, sharp bursts of energy to get to the ball. I became interested in skydiving from a pretty early age. I was about uh, eight years old when I saw my first parachute drop. Uh, I lived about 12 miles from a rural Air Force base, and they used to have displays once a year. So I really was interested from a very early age. Lee, a manager of research and development for a computer firm, holds a PhD in robotics from Oxford University. My first jump was, uh, I was actually on top and somebody came along and this was instructing me and he docked below me. And uh, it was just incredible to see a canopy so close to you. They look really huge when you're not used to it. And uh, it's kind of scary having this thing suddenly hitting you on the back. It's very exciting and I just go out, go to, to skydive for my own pleasure, it's very selfish, but um, it's also very relaxing when you've got a high-powered, fast-moving job. You just want to go away and just completely um, dive into something completely different, um, something which takes over your whole mind. Finding teammates with the courage and skill to go for records is a challenge for those who want to push the limits of the sport. For the few who do work in all women CRW teams, the rewards outweigh the challenges. When you jump with all women, I think you tend to have a lot more cooperation and a lot more patience. In fact, I think that's true in a lot of areas of life. I guess the flip side of, of having a lot of patience is sometimes people are not as competitive or not as aggressive uh, as you would have to be in a co-ed group. I don't see any difference um, between jumping in a mixed team or with a, with a whole, all women's team. There was a, quite a bit of tension, as you can imagine, when we were doing the world record attempt. And towards the end of the time, uh, I did notice that people, were, the women, were getting a, a lot tireder and were starting to get a little irritable. Women tend to be much more safety conscious. They tend to be much gentler in their approaches. Um, there's a certain camaraderie that happens between an all-women's group that does not happen when it's a co-ed group. All the women pulled together and were not competing against each other for certain slots. Um, it's a male-dominated sport, so it's a totally different um, atmosphere with all, just all women. Keep tension there. And that's, that's the only way you're gonna... Sixteen women, with thousands of jumps between them, now gather together for a common goal to break the women's canopy stacking world record. We're gonna do it? Yeah! Ready, set, go! What will it take for this diverse group of women to achieve a world record in this impressive and dangerous sport? A world record skydive demands skill and dedication from its participants. But records aren't set without planning and direction. So if somebody on approach 
this double challenge fell to expert skydiver Lori Bartlett. She took the job with determination and confidence, the same attitude she takes with her into the sky. I think as a leader, my goal, my job was more to create enthusiasm, give them all the participants energy. This exciting rush of energy was coupled with an enormous sense of fear the first time she jumped from a plane. This same sense of excitement that drew Lori to skydiving has kept her coming back for nearly 1,000 jumps. I fell in love, basically. It was one of those rushes where you saw everybody go up and down and up and down and laugh and have a great time, and you were scared to death, and you knew there was a reason not to be scared to death. You had to find out what it was. And scared to death the first jump, scared to death the second, and by about the third, I started relaxing, and I was hooked into it. Lori knew she had what it took to organize a new record. The first women's record, set in the mid-1980s by a French team, was a stack of 10. This record was broken by Lori and other women several years later when they docked and flew an 11 stack. Lori put the word out through the skydiving grapevine that she wanted to go for a new women's record. One of the first to respond was an old skydiving friend, Linda Stokely. Linda, a public relations expert, is a single parent. When you bring your feet to pursue her sport, she has overcome the prejudice of those who would rather see her in a more traditional role. My son Ray is seven years old and he's been a true inspiration to me. I knew for a long time that I wanted to be a mother and the biological time clock was ticking. It was hard to give up skydiving in order to have a son, but I balanced it out and decided it was worth the sacrifice. Um, I think that people who don't know anything about skydiving think that it's rather foolhardy for a single mother to be skydiving. Um, I wouldn't, again, I wouldn't be jumping in the first place if I thought that I was going to lose my life. I feel a lot more afraid of driving on the freeway or contracting cancer. I think there are much more likely ways of dying. And for my son, I feel that I'm showing him that you can do whatever you want and to become an achiever and not to let the struggles of life stand in your way. Linda's positive and confident outlook on life more than compensated for her inexperience in canopy relative work. She's got a real strong determination to overcome certain weaknesses of herself and CRW was kind of scary to her and she really went strong and overcame her, her fear and became very confident in her slot, which was, I'm real proud of her and she brought that strength and determination with her to the other people. After a six month recruitment campaign, Lori begins working with a core group of women including Josie Kerlinski, Linda Stokely, and Lee Boswell. I heard about um, the record attempt being put together, and I was a bit nervous because I really had only done um, fairly small stacks before that, maximum of five or six. Uh, I didn't know anybody who I'd be jumping with, and um, was unsure about what it would be like to jump with a whole lot of women. Um, but uh, I decided I'd give it a go and see how these practice jumps went and uh, it all worked out very well. We all got on extremely well together. No personality conflicts at all. The women jumped together nearly every weekend, learning to master the subtle techniques of canopy flight and docking. But as they begin to form larger and larger stacks, they realize they need someone on the ground who knows the sport. This someone is Rod Boswell. The goal was obviously to get a world record and whatever it took to get there with the people we had. And I was real thankful Rod was around because he did most of the criticism and, and I did most of the patting on the back and yahooing. So that helped a lot. He wants to turn downwind away from him. And it's a lot of work going on up top. Rod Boswell, Lee's husband, is an ex-captain in the British Royal Marines and organized and jumped with the team which holds the current record for the men's canopy stack. It was um, self-preservation more than anything else, frankly. Uh, Lee was very nervous initially about the size of the stack and the comments that she made about, um, you know, about the relative in inexperience of the other people. And she knew that I'd been involved a lot in big stacks, obviously, because she'd been on the sidelines at the time. And she asked, asked me if I'd be interested in helping out. Um, 
and I said, no, no problem. Abilities, expertise, and experience vary from woman to woman. Laurie and Rod guided and taught the team, helping each woman become the best she could in her position. Everybody came in with different experiences, levels, different confidence levels, different um, desires on where they wanted to be in the stack. Some of them came in very competitive and wanted to do the best and, and work into the hardest slots. And that was great because they learned very, very fast. And I was able to use them where I needed them. They could dock higher in the stack or they could dock lower in the stack. I was very confident in them. Some of the people were pretty secure in only certain positions. That's all the skill that they developed and that's all the skill they wanted to develop. For four months, the core group jumps together almost every weekend. Sometimes they're joined by other women and hook up into stacks of seven, eight, or nine. Rising before dawn, they jump more each weekend than most skydivers do in a month. When we were training, um, we were doing five or six jumps a day, maximum of six, and um, most of the time it was five. We started pretty early in the morning because uh, the beginning of the day, when it's very cold, the air is a lot stiller and there's less turbulence, so we would try and get um, most of our jumps done at the beginning or the end of the day. As the practice weekends extend into the fall, Rod, used to coaching men, gains a new respect for the women involved. It was fascinating for me, coaching the women, at how well they handled the, the strength requirement and the tension and stack. And also, the other thing was their courage, which was actually quite outstanding, really. I mean, there, there were several of them that were really very scared uh, of what they were doing and just, just basically coped with it and ignored it. And a couple that actually got injured and didn't let on that they'd been injured because they wanted to continue jumping. So it was, from my point of view, it was very impressive. Each woman's location in the stack is assigned by Lori and Rod, based upon her strength, experience, and the configuration of her canopy. Each dive is choreographed and practiced on the ground. A dirt dive is when skydivers practice on the ground the maneuvers that they're going to be doing in the air. And a dirt dive is very, very valuable because you want it to be second nature when you're up in the air. By practicing it on the ground, you can work out some of the problems that may occur in the air that you're not going to be able to communicate in the air. So you walk through exactly what you're, you're going to do, even to the extent of talking to other people, putting your hands out. It looks a little bit silly, but sometimes you might forget something like that, and that could be fatal to the jump or um, just take up extra time in altitude. With each weekend jump, their skill level progresses. They learn to fly accurately and to dock as quickly and safely as possible. They work through difficulties that most men's skydiving teams never encounter. Many skydiving records are held by military teams, like the United States Army Golden Knights or Rod's British Royal Marine Team. As of yet, no women participate in the canopy relative work divisions of these teams. Military teams and teams with corporate sponsorships hold another advantage over Lori's group, compatible equipment. Gear was a real detriment. We needed to have better gear. It would have been nice, obviously, to have all the same parachutes so that we could count on our gear and only work on our skills. As it was, the difficulty was we had to compensate for the gear that we were flying, as well as develop skills to overcome them. So it was a little bit more difficult for everybody. Prior to starting the world record attempt, Lori and I attempted to get sponsorship through one of the canopy companies so that we could all have compatible shoots. Would have made this attempt much, much easier. We weren't able to line up that sponsorship, and so we had to work with what we had. The other difference between the women's record and the men's was that they all had identical canopies, and they had their weight all well calculated out, all military style, whereas we had 
four or five different kinds of canopies. Nobody knew anybody else's weight, but we just kind of played around with it until it worked. <laughs> so it was quite a lot, a lot less organized, as you can imagine. Uh, so one of the reasons we wanted to try and keep the order was more because we had different parachutes at different levels. And we had the foot, the top two um, were all identical and were, were uh, fairly big, fast flying and stable. And then we had um, two or three other kinds below with the smallest ones on the bottom. You have to be a pretty brave coach of a ladies' team to ask them their weight. <laughs> I can tell you. And I ain't that brave. Or their age. Or their age. <laughs> you know, that's real serious bravery stuff, that is. Each type of canopy has a unique flight pattern and reacts differently in the shifting airspace of the staff. The variety in canopy type, as well as in the weight and abilities of the women, contributes to the condition that strikes fear into a skydiver, oscillation or snaking of the stack. Sometimes the, the stack starts oscillating or snaking because of, of an incompatibility of parachutes or if the nose, and the nose is the front part of the canopy, if the nose gets turned under and starts to deflate, that can cause an oscillation if somebody hits the stack too hard. Sometimes you can be doing everything right and it'll be just a wind current that you can do nothing about. Occasionally, the docking canopy comes in at the wrong angle or with too much speed. This also can cause the stack to snake. If you hit the stack with any sort of momentum or you hit it off center, that'll start a pendulum back and forth and that'll work its way up into the stack so pretty soon uh, you'll have some momentum going and, and it'll start to sway and at that point you try to stabilize it uh, try to not hit it from the bottom at that moment because that'll continue the pendulum or the snaking effect uh, sometimes it can be pretty scary if it's if it's swaying real hard and, and you're trying to hold on uh, and at the same time you want to stop the shaking so you're trying to put some pressure on there to stop it and then you'll have to always worry if it tangles up of practice, the women learn to avoid oscillation when possible and to recover from it when it occurs. Lori feels confident that the team is ready to expand to 16 women. She selects a weekend in mid-October to go for the record. As the summer turns to fall, the women continue their intense practice schedule. They are determined to set the new world record. Then we watched us again. <laughs> An October Saturday morning at the Madera Parachute Center in California's Central Valley. For two days, 15 women have been jumping five to six times a day. Some jumps have been stacks of 12 or 13, new unofficial world records. But today is different. Today they go for the official world record. The team has been selling raffle tickets and t-shirts for months to cover some of the costs. The women have spent thousands of dollars to participate in the record attempt. They hope today their investment will pay off. Other women who have practiced with the team won't arrive at the parachute center till Saturday night. Even though a stack of 12 will beat the current record, Lori decides that they will start by attempting a 15 stack including every woman available, going for the largest possible record. To qualify as a record, the stack must be witnessed by three certified judges. It must fly for a minimum of five seconds. Every skydiver who boards the plane must dock on the stack. A 14 stack won't be a world record if a 15th is in the air and cannot dock. Finally, there must be visual documentation of the record. Tom Sanders, a top-notch skydiver and cameraman, is on hand to record the record attempt. To make a record attempt a official record, what you need is judges, official judges, to watch the record attempt, and you need documentation. And the documentation needs to actually be in the form of still photographs and videotape. 
Tom and second cameraman Brad Hood jump with the women, filming the flights with up to four helmet-mounted cameras. One of the, the nice things about filming a canopy stack is all the different variety of colors in the parachutes. And as they build the formation up there high in the sky, you got this beautiful backdrop up there. And it is an incredible sight when you see a vertically mounted stack with all these parachutes. But it's the cameras Tom mounts on the women that truly bring the viewer up close and personal. A little tighter on this one. Yeah. What was really neat is these women are going for a record and they were willing to wear cameras to get that close up and personal feeling. They actually wore cameras in the formation. So they're not only going for a record, but they're wearing cameras and documenting it in a way that they don't need to. It's not required to. The film is for posterity to document the record. The video has a more immediate purpose. After each jump, Rod and the women review their technique through the magic of video cameras small enough to be mounted on Tom's helmet. Learning from their mistakes, the women build stacks faster and faster. With time and gravity as their adversaries, success depends on a quick start from team leader Lori, who exits first and begins building the stack from top to bottom. We try to make that first hook up within 30 seconds. And when she comes real close to me, I grab the top skin of her canopy and kick into her lines. Um, at that point in time, she'll hit what we call breaks, which creates float in the canopy and brings me down those center lines. And to stay down there, she has what we call a cross connector, which is between the two risers right above her head. And I kick into those, and it keeps me put right down there. At that point in time, I'm... I go back up to my steering and make sure the formation is consistently on heading so everybody else knows where to go and they follow suit. When you approach the stack, you approach from beneath it and you just hit your canopy right on their hands. They're waiting to catch you. And you just hit the brakes that causes the canopy to pop up a little bit at the same time as they're just shimmying basically down the lines. Although it may sound simple, docking is neither easy nor safe. Lines can entangle, chutes can collapse. It is up to the woman involved to determine if she can salvage a bad dock. Depending upon the stack's elevation and her position in the stack, a woman may attempt a second or even third dock if the first is unsuccessful. If you miss your um, approach, um, then it depends on, on, on the group you're jumping with. Um, the way we had organized it was that you would try a second time, and if you were absolutely nowhere near it on the second time, then you would actually let the person behind you come in. And then you'd try and stay in sequence, but just be one behind where you should be. They were very controlled in their approaches. They were very careful. When, when whenever any of them really had a bad jump, they tended to, to do two attempts and then get out of the way. Often the stack's elevation is just too low, dangerously low, and the skydivers abandon the stack. When we were uh, going for the record attempts, we tried to break off at 3,500 or 3,000 feet, and that's for safety so that everyone has time to get in clean air and separate uh, and land without being on top of each other. Friends, family, and skydiving fans have come from across the West to lend their support for the record attempt. The women have never performed in front of a crowd as a team. Nerves are skittish. The first five jumps of the day are short of the record. I'm just another girl. skydive for crying out loud. Yeah. Lori and Rod offer yeah. encouragement and advice. Like the pressure is on. Dusk approaches as the plane ascends for the last jump of the day. Despite their physical exhaustion, the women commit every last ounce of energy to build the 15 stack and achieve a new world record.
held a 14 stack in record time. The stack holds steady as Erin Marin flies into dock. In anticipation of her success, the crowd cheers, but Erin misses her landing and aborts the dock. Time and elevation are running out. The stack drifts dangerously low to the ground, but Lori, determined for the record, waves Erin in for another attempt. It is their final chance. wanting to surrender the joy of this record-breaking flight. After flying for an incredible 45 seconds, the stack breaks into biplanes. The jubilant women return to the elated crowd below. Despite the odds against them, the women achieve their goal. A new world record, a stack 15 canopies high. This is Josie's 600th jump and Lori's 1,000th. For all the women, it is a memory to cherish forever, a peak experience in their lives. the record as Coach Rod toasts to their success. With the arrival Saturday night of additional women, the team decides to go for broke. On Sunday morning, they will try breaking their own world record, only hours old, unaware that the first jump of the day will court disaster. Yeah, we're going to so say three grand. Sunday morning. All the women's experience and skill will soon be challenged by a life-threatening accident. But the energy is high. They've set a new record and they're ready for more. I think everyone wanted to go for another world record attempt. Uh, we were feeling good and we had got the first one and everything was going smoothly. We hadn't had any uh, serious wraps or entanglements. The, the women that showed up were fairly experienced. so. Everyone was pretty enthusiastic. Spirits are high as they prepare to break the record they set just hours before. But even in the midst of the excitement, the skydivers pack their parachutes with care. But sometimes I can't tell if you're done. Everyone has their own method for packing a parachute. It's sort of like if you have your favorite shirt that you wear to the ball game and they always win. People have their way of doing it. And, and there are a lot of different ways and no one way is better than any other way. Um, the most important thing is that your lines don't get tangled up or twisted. Uh, aside from that, the parachute is made to open. So no matter how you happen to stuff it into the bag, it's, it's pretty much going to open. The reserve chutes are packed by riggers, and the quality of their work could be the difference between life and death. For the frightening time will come in every skydiver's career, when the reserve must be deployed. Okay. Like I said, here's my reserve. 
I had my first reserve ride when I had 60 jumps, and actually it was a very good feeling because all the time that you're training, you're practicing what do I do if there's a problem with my main chute. In the back of a skydiver's mind, you're always wondering when push comes to shove, am I going to be able to jettison my main parachute, go back into free fall, and pull that reserve? So when I had my first reserve ride, to me, when I landed, I was elated because I felt like when push comes to shove, I can function, I will do the correct procedures, and I will do them in time, and it made me even more committed to the sport. CRW chutes are packed to allow the nose to inflate almost immediately, giving the skydiver maximum flight time under the canopy. There are important differences in the design of parachutes used for stacking. The advantage to using the kind of chute that I have is that it has a retractable pilot chute, and a pilot chute is the little chute that inflates the main parachute. It, when it retracts, it deflates, thereby there's less of a chance that it's going to be entangled with another part of the other person's parachute, so it's a safety factor. <laughs> Chutes packed, the women run through one last dirt dive. It takes a lot of practice. When you have that many people, it takes a lot of time just to organize it, to get everyone thinking along the same wavelength, uh, to have everyone working together. You, you really have to trust each other uh, in something like this crew stack because you're really putting your life in everyone else's hands. The plane is a twin-engine otter. The otter has a minimal prop blast, allowing the women to deploy their chutes almost immediately upon exit from the airplane. As they ascend to their starting altitude of 12,500 feet, the women reflect upon their main enemy, time. With every second of free fall, the women lose 500 feet of altitude. Under canopy, this loss decreases to 1,000 feet per minute. They have about 10 minutes to build to the stack of 16. form the cornerstone of the stack, jump almost simultaneously. The 12 others quickly follow and begin the flight to their waiting destiny. even more quickly than the day before. The skydivers fly incredibly close to the building stack. They each have just 40 seconds to dock. successfully docks in the 16th position. The strain on the arms and legs is nearly unbearable for those on the top of the stack. They hang on with determination. 
the new record is only seconds from their grasp. Are they strong enough to hold it? They hold for an amazing 22 seconds, then begin breaking away to the cheers of the crowd below. But unknown to the cheering crowd, trouble develops with the blue and white canopy deep in the center of the staff. The crowd watches in horror as the chute deflates and the entire stack collapses into a swirl of plummeting canopies. It happened because we ended up with some oscillation in the stack while it was building and number five, Cheryl Lane, who's now my hero, ended up getting shook loose. Her legs got shook loose from the line that keeps her held down into the parachute. And she was holding on to probably about 200 pounds just with her arms while this stack was building. And she was complaining, but everybody was encouraging her to hold on within the stack. And she kept saying, I can do it, I can do it. And as our last person docked, she's going, she's losing it. And she started slipping back up the lines. Her feet were below what we call a slider. And the slider is what keeps the, gives the parachute a slower opening. It keeps everything closed until the air really catches it and opens. Well, that slider goes back up. It collapses the parachute. But her feet were taking the, the slider back up, collapsing the parachute as she slid back up these lines. Pretty soon, the parachute she was sliding up collapsed. With so much weight, she couldn't hold on to it anymore because there's nothing. She lost the whole flotation of that canopy, just sunk down on her and she dropped it from number five down. We had meanwhile gotten, I think, four people off the bottom, but everything just went right through the middle. The women tried desperately to fly free from the maze of entangled lines and canopies. One of the girls on the staff who had joined us just recently had a, a long pilot chute dangling out behind the canopy. Well, nobody was aware of this until you broke away and tried to, to separate. Obviously, they found out that their canopies were tied together and started to spin because you've got a rotation effect. Um, and then what you do is, is cut away, talk to each other and decide who's going to cut away and um, what altitude you're at and fire your reserve, which is what she did. Just hundreds of feet above the ground, Becky Livingstone releases herself from the tangled chute, returns to free fall, and deploys her reserve. Her main chute remains entangled in Patty Davis's lines. One by one, the women return to Earth. Although no one was hurt in the stack collapse, they will tempt fate no more. Falling angels, after months of concentrated effort, achieve their goal. Receiving no trophy or prize of any kind, their achievement is reward enough. have defied the odds and conquered the sky.